Okay, so when we did force analysis and how force is affected translational motion, we went through this process which included drawing a very important free body diagram to really examine not only what interactions were happening, but how those forces looked pictorially. Well, when we want to analyze rotational motion, we do a similar process. We know that like forces, it's torques that cause an object to rotate. And when we think about the importance of torque and what it involves, it, it involves both a force, but also where that force is located. And where that force is located and how it's angled relative to the axis of rotation is what's important in generating the torque and thus the rotational change in that object. And so we use a similar process to analyze torques. It's not called a free body diagram, but it's called an extended free body diagram, where we can not only look at where, what the forces are acting on the object, but where those forces are acting. So this mini lecture is gonna look at a very simplistic view of the extended free body diagram. In situations where all of our forces act perfectly perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So our most effective location for those forces. So let's imagine that you are walking by a construction site and you see up on that scaffolding a board between the two poles of the scaffolding. And on the board, one of the construction workers is sitting on the end and she's enjoying her lunch, sitting there at the end. Another construction worker, while well, she's not yet on her lunch break, and so she's smack dab in the middle of that beam doing a little bit of construction work. Her lunch, however, is sitting waiting for her a little bit away. And last but not least, everyone likes to have a pet on site to cheer their mood. And so these two women have a cat sitting, waiting for them to finish their day's worth of work. All right, so here is the situation that we have in what we want to analyze. And depending, you can imagine, safety precautions of construction wants to make sure that these boards, which are not fastened down on the scaffolding, don't tip or rotate. So if we were to analyze the situation, for example, if a third construction worker marched herself on up there and stood at a very specific location, would the board tip? Might be something that we need to be attentive to. So how do we analyze the forces acting on this board for a variety of different analysis processes? Well, we're just gonna use this as a drawing, as a example of an extended free body diagram. Now, the first step in the process for analyzing torques is to identify the object that we are looking at the rotation of. So this idea of identifying our object in a scenario is pretty consistent across our different um, uh, physics analyses. Well, the object we care about is indeed the board. Okay, so. We're interested in knowing about the rotational state of that board. Like in our force analysis, we then look at what are the interactions. What's interacting with the board? All right, well, let's just start on the left side and move to the right. We see that the first interaction with the board is the cat. So there's a force of the cat between the board and the cat. The cat, after all, is interacting with the board. As we continue to move to the right, we see the scaffolding brace. So we have the force of scaffolding one. And that's because we're gonna have another one later. So that's between the board and scaffolding number one. As we move a little bit further, we have our construction worker number one. So that's between the board, my goodness, I keep spelling board wrong, and worker one. Moving on, we have the force of lunch one. That's between the board and construction worker one's lunch. 
keep going, we have scaffolding number two. Between the board and scaffolding post two. As we get to the very end, we have the construction worker number two between the board and worker number two. And then we have a force that we don't see always as obvious. We know that the board has mass. It's an object. And so gravity also acts on that board between the board and the earth. So here are all of our interactions. Very similar process than if we were doing force analysis on this board. Okay, so how does a free body diagram look? Well, instead of a dot, like when we used a free body diagram for forces, an extended free body diagram is simply an extension of that dot, an extension of that object. Now, as a general practice, I like to draw the object in the orientation that it actually exists. It helps me to visualize those forces a little bit easier as I place them in their orientation on my, on my diagram. We then simply place the forces where they exist on that object. So the force of the cat is close to the end of the object. So we'll say the force of the cat is acting there. We then have the scaffolding. Well, that's just a little bit in and it's holding that board up. So as the board pushes down on that scaffolding, the scaffolding pushes back up. We have our construction worker, not quite in the center, but slightly off center. She's probably more massive than the cat, maybe a lot more massive. So we have the force of construction worker one. We know that the force of gravity acts in the geometric center of a uniformly distributed object. So we're going to say this board is uniformly distributed. So the force of gravity is acting right in the center. Our lunch is slightly further to the right for that construction worker. We then have another scaffolding and we have our construction worker on the end. Now, we might look at that picture and say, hmm, well, if this object isn't moving up or down, my ups have to match my downs. So my references, my relative lengths may not necessarily be accurate. And as we analyze the motion, we'll see where those relative lengths come into play. But from a just generic representation in direction and, and somewhat maybe at least alluding to how the forces may compare, this might not be too bad. If I were to re-examine this as I'm drawing them, I might say, Ugh, that scaffolding is going to be stronger, higher, larger, bigger than these that are all pointing down. So I might elect to extend my scaffolding. And as again, as we analyze it, we might realize exactly those values. And if I were given values, we might have that as well. Okay, so we've not only represented the object, and I'm just gonna identify this object here, like a dual color, but where those forces are relative to the object. So in, in general, this is the beginning of our extended free body diagram. Now we know that when we analyze torques, remember, we are interested in both the force, which I've put on there, and the radius. And remember, this is from the axis of rotation, which we call the pivot point. Now, where we select the pivot point is up to us in our analysis. And we're going to get strategic about where that pivot point is selected. But for now, let's just pick a pivot point value. That might make some sense. If I were to add another construction worker, let's say on the end, maybe the object would rotate about this pivot point. Again, it does not really matter. It's kind of like setting the origin where you set that pivot point, but 
we will get strategic with it as we move through our analysis. So the reason I want to put a pivot point on there is we, we now need to identify radii and what that means so that when we do the torque analysis, we can use the proper values for that radii. So it's the radii from the pivot point to the force. So the radius for construction worker number two is represented by that value. The radius for scaffolding number two, well that's zero because it's at the pivot point. The radius for the lunch is represented by that arrow. The radius for the force of gravity. The radius for construction worker number one. The radius for scaffolding number one and the radius for the cat. So all radii, oh, I've, oh no, I have it up there. All radii are represented on our extended free body diagram include, uh, referencing that pivot point. Now, as we learned about torques, we can see which direction each of these torques, each of these forces would induce a torque based on that pivot point. Now this isn't part of the extended free body diagram, but let's just practice that in, in addition. So here is our extended free body diagram showing the object as a elongated dot. The force is acting at the locations as they are on that object, identifying a pivot point, and then identifying the different radii. So as you continue your analysis, you will want to remember to think about the directions of the torque. The force on the torque of construction worker number two, well, she would rotate the object clockwise. Sorry, negative direction. Clockwise rotation. The torque of scaffolding number two, well, there's no radius, so there's no torque. The torque of lunch one, lunch one would cause the object to rotate in the counterclockwise direction, so a positive torque. The torque of the force of gravity, positive. The torque of construction worker one, positive all would result in that object rotating about the pivot point in the positive direction or the counterclockwise direction. The torque of scaffolding one is negative. It would cause the object to rotate in the clockwise direction. And finally, the torque of the cat is positive. So as you do the analysis, it's always useful to remind yourself what the direction of that torque might look like. All right, so free body diagrams, like forces, are just like extended free body diagrams with torques, but we have to add not only where those forces are acting, but a pivot point and the radii of each one of those forces. Okay, good job.